Hey. <laughs> What's up? Yes. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that first part of our lecture too. And yes, I hope you did enjoy that world view. Well, sort of a generalized world view of the physical geography of here. And now we're moving on to the third part of lecture two which will focus on the review of the concepts of geology. And yes, let's talk about those supplemental videos that I linked in our VLE course site. All of those videos are only a support or supplemental videos. So it's not really the focus of our course, but this will help to, well, recap and to give sort of a lightning jolt to those neurons that were once dormant or dead in your brains when you were sleeping in your geology class <laughs> anyway so yes those videos will only give you a recap of your geology 11 and your by 100 lectures as it will give a timeline of how life did exist or did form on earth <coughs> So much of this video are only a support for the subject, especially for the concepts of geology. But what I want you to focus is the synthesis. What, what I want you to do is focus on this concept and use it in the synthesis of your or application in your reading material, especially for the case of the Philippine setting. Okay, so with that, let's move on with part 3 of the okay. For the third part of our lecture, we'll focus on the review of some geological concepts, starting with the continental drift theory. Introduced by Alfred L. Wegener in his book The Origin of Continents and Ocean in 1915, which suggests that continents were once joined into this large landmass called the supercontinent Pangaea, meaning all land. Pangaea all land, which is surrounded by the ocean Pantalasia during the late Paleozoic 280 million years ago. And starting at the Jurassic period during 180 million years ago, it broke off into these two large masses called Laurasia and Gondwana land, with Tethys Sea in between. And thus, the continent further drifted apart until they reached their present position of today, the ones that we mentioned earlier. Okay. How did Wegener come to this conclusion? He was a keen observer. No? He saw some fitness of different continents, kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. This observation was already noticed by people long ago, no? especially the coastline of South America and Africa. Yeah? If you look at it, no? there's a certain... Even a layman or even a child would notice how South America fits into Africa. There's not even a child on Earth that wouldn't do that wouldn't fit no kind of fit these two together but what's important about what Wegener saw was there's this invisible line underwater these contour lines of the oceans and when he sees this he extended the boundaries of the continent into its continental shelf and using this picture he have created the first no, reconstruction of the once Pangea before and during that time, it was pretty radical because it was new. No? The American says the continents are fixed, while European thinks they move, but they move up and down. But Wegener says, no, they move, but they move horizontally from each other. And so in his paper, in his book in 1915 onwards, he published that. But during that time, he was regarded as a suspicious individual because this is a, well, in science, well, before and until now, no? novelty is something to be treated with caution. No? There is this suspicion, especially for scientists, well, it's their job to doubt things. But especially when it comes to novelty, no? we are very suspicious of it. So every fundamental concept, every novel concept, it is fundamentally doubtful for us to just believe it. And especially for Wegener, which he is because he is regarded as a, an outsider for the geoscience well, community before, and because his focus back then was more on 
he was an astronomer, rather a geologist. So he wasn't taken that seriously before. And he didn't know no, what forces underlie this movement, no? this horizontal movement of the continents. He theorized uh, <clears throat> the gravitational pull of the moon and the sun that causes this movement. So it wasn't really the thing that causes the movement of these continents. So that's why he wasn't really taken seriously by the geologist back then. For the case of your botanist back then, they were well, they were responded very positively because it explained the distribution of plants and animals over, all over the world. That's why the botany teams, well, they were fond of the theory of continental drift because it explained why this there is this certain distribution of organisms. That's why the botanical people were more welcoming for the th theory than the, yes, geological people. Anyway, so using different data set, he also have, you know, have mapped this certain spread of index fossils. Like for example of Signonatus Sign and the alligator-like freshwater Mesosaurus, which is found both in the South American and African continents. And also for the case of your fern fossil called Glossopteris, which is distributed in the five continents. So it actually explains the distribution, the, the drifting of this continent, the horizontal movement of this continent up from Pangaea up to the certain, up to the this point in time, have explained you know, this distribution of certain species. Wegener saw that virtually there is the same fossil record you know, in the stratigraphic columns that were very similar across different continents. This idea of Wegener of continents drifting would explain that distribution would only make sense if the continents have moved, especially for the case of the fern fossil, which is which can't move and has a very limited dispersal mechanism. And also that's also true for the case of our web reptiles that can't swim large distances of the ocean. And the next evidence for Wegener was the similarities in rock types, especially for the case of sedimentary layers in South America and Africa. So there is this lithologic and structural similarities of mountains in your Atlantic Canada and the Northern Britain, that these rocks and geologic structures are found on in certain continents that were once connected before, no? matching continent, so to speak. And the last evidence for Wegener was the presence of paleoclimatic evidences, which are essentially are your glacial deposit during the Carboniferous and Permian. So this glacial deposit during the Carboniferous and Permian glaciation were found across both America, South Africa, and India, Antarctica, and Australia. That's why, they, that's why it's so interesting. No? That's why it also support the theory because why would that be? These this continents are farther apart from each other would only mean that they are joined before, once before, no? for this to occur, for the glacial deposits to be in that way. So that's the paleoclimatic evidences, no? glacial deposits that were found across different continents. So yes, that's continental drift. Now we move on to seafloor spreading. So seafloor spreading uh, suggests that sea removes the and carries the crust along with it. No? So essentially the, the crux of your seafloor spreading is that there is this ridges, oceanic ridges, no? forming a reef axis that spreads no? apart, creating a rift. No? And essentially new crust is formed in, in this rift. No? Created, these rifts are, are of course created by the convection current of the mantle pushing the older material away underneath. This was proposed by Harry Hammond Hess in 1960. So this concept was drawn as the result of extensive mapping of the seafloor topography initially for yes for military tactics. Yes, because there are large naval battles where there's a need for submarines. No, it's hard to detect submarines, especially the U-boats of the Germans. So yep, they have to map the seafloor for that. 
yeah, a lot of inventions were done for, well, inventions that are good now, especially the GPS, for example, yeah, was done in the effort to kill people or to take an advantage to the enemy. <laughs> so, oceanic ridges are these long sinuous ridges that occupy the, the middle no, of your, for example, your Atlantic Ocean and eastern part of the Pacific Oceans. So, uh, oceanic ridges are really where new, no? new crust is being created, special oceanic crust. So that's uh, seafloor spreading. So there's a difference between the age of the sediments here or the rocks here from the age of the rocks in here. It's much newer than this because it spread from here to that portion. Okay. And then we go to plate tectonics. So basically the concept in plate tectonics is that heat inside the earth drives the motions. That we have this convection currents throughout which heat is dissipated from the interior of the earth whose convection currents then have an impact on what happens on the surface of course. So as the convection currents rise, rises, the surface of the earth is actually fractured or ruptured and portions of the earth's surfaces is spread away from the rising convection currents. That spreading drags the Earth's surface along and eventually back down to the interior of the Earth in what we call subduction zones. And these also drive the motion of the continents, what's sometimes referred to as continental drift. Yes, by Wegener. Uh, so sediments can accumulate on the continental margin as they get incorporated into mountain belts. And then melting of the slabs of the mantle above it can lead to volcanoes such as we find in the Andean and Chilean mountain ranges. And of course, what we also find in the Philippines too. If we back off and look at what this looks like on a planetary scale, we can see that the whole planet can be divided into a series of fragments which we call plates and it's the motion of those fragments whose plates, those pla fragments, those plates that explains the earthquake, volcanoes, and the host of other features of the planets that we live on. So that's the real interesting. So plate tectonics is actually a very unifying theory for the field of geology. So plate tectonics uh, essentially explains the Earth's lithosphere no? is made up of this moderately rigid plates that may consist of the oceanic, continental, or a combination of both. So these plates are made up of crust and the upper mantle that, that moves along the lithosphere, uh, asthenosphere boundary because of the certain plasticity in your asthenosphere. It's a unifying theory because it synthesizes the uh, evidences of continental drift theory, the seafloor spreading, and the magnetism, magnetic evidences into this theory of geology that tries to explain how all geological features are processed and related. And that's why we have these different types of plate boundaries. So yeah, these are the different types of plate boundaries. And we have the divergent plate. So divergent plate boundaries are the reason for creating the ridges and rip zone. No? which serve as the spreading center where new crust is created. So essentially, your divergent plates is where two plates are moving away from each other and creating this new crust. So the next is the convergent plate. So for the case of the convergent plate, we have three types. We have oceanic to continental, oceanic to oceanic, and we have continental to continental. For the case of oceanic to continental, will form what we call a trenches, no? trenches and this is formed due to the subduction of the oceanic crust underneath and during this subduction the slab the oceanic crust the slab of this subducting part of your the denser part will melt and create the volcanic arc around that region this is the case for peru and for the case of an oceanic crust going to an oceanic crust will also create an island arc right there. And since both of them are also oceanic, the older and the more dense one will still sink than the other and will create volcanic arc islands. Now for the case of the continental crust to continental crust convergent plates will create high mountains like for the example of your 
Himalayan ranges. That's why there are a lot of earthquakes there too because these two, the Indian plate and the Eurasian plate are banging each other up. That's so why there's this, this force of mountain building right there. And yes, the, as, as I was mentioning before, the Marianas Trench and the Philippine Trench are examples of this, where there are large subduction zones being created as uh, this, this ocean crust is plunging towards and bending at the edge of the neighbor. Okay, so for the case of transformed plates, we have, for the case of San Andreas Fault, these transformed plate boundaries are what we call Yes, they are what we call conservative plate boundaries because there are no materials there are no materials being created or destroyed here. No, they are conservative. So these are characterized by plates sliding horizontally past each other and would create a strike slip faults. Earthquakes are also present in these regions, no? As they are well still moving. So this is case of the San Andreas fault. Okay, so we also have the what we call the Pacific Ring of Fire. No? So these are areas of high activity, earthquake activity and high volcanic activity. It, this is due to the fact that there is a lot going on in this region. This is where some plates meet, some plates subduct, and some plates are smashing to each other. So for the case of the Pacific Ring of Fire, there is a lot of things going on in that. So, okay. <clears throat> Moving on with plate tectonics and climate. The effect of plate tectonics and climate. For the first part, plate tectonics would be responsible for the continental distribution. And of course, different patterns of continental distribution, how it is arranged on the Earth. So, for example, if you imagine Pangea, what would the vegetation would look like in that? land mass no it's a great land mass but what would happen is that it would just look like australia where only the edges the coastal edges would have this vegetation and the interior portion of the land would have large vast amount of deserts yes that would happen for the case of Pangea, if you have that certain distribution of land yes continental distribution affects climate so the, the coastal areas of Pangea would be highly vegetated or would, high, would have high amount of rain while the interior part of Pangea would, would le more or less experience a arid climate. No? But for the case of albedo in general, how would continental distribution affect albedo or the rate of the amount of light that is reflected on your surfaces when we say albedo? It's the amount of light that is reflected on a certain surface. So, how would continental distribution affect albedo? This would be, as I mentioned earlier, have you remembered the first video? This would be for the case of ice formation. Because as I have said earlier, ice formation is easier. So, the formation of ice is, yes, is easier on land masses than on your ocean. So, say for example, if your land masses are near the poles, no? Ice formation or the formation of this glacier would, or this ice shelf would be easier and would be larger than, say, for example, your land masses are only in the equator. So, since it is harder for your ice to form at ocean, at an ocean, than on your land mass, it would affect the albedo of your of the Earth, because if there are more ice. It would, since it is white, it would reflect more light. Diba? And if there are less ice, it would not reflect or more accept more light in that case. So continental distribution would also create differences in the latitude of your area. And we all know that different latitude means different climate. If you have an area that is near the equator, it would have a tropical climate. And if it is away from the equator, it would have a more or less temperate climate. Or if it's far from the equator, it's if it's in the poles, no, the climate would be really cold. 
So the next part, uh, plate tectonics affecting climate, is continental elevation. Say, for example, how different elevations are created by mountain building events. Like, for say, for example, the case of Indian plate smashing right into the Eurasian plate. It creates this high, very high altitude. Right? I mean, yes, very high elevation of mountains. And of course, that differences in elevation would actually equate to differences in temperature because as we all know as you increase in temp in elevation you also increase in temperature or i mean you also decrease in temperature it's colder on higher elevation like for example uh, on baguio on sagada than in manila uh, lower elevation so things like that no because uh, as you increase no your elevation, there's actually this change, no? uh, 6.5 degrees centigrade change or lapse rate no? in your per kilometer in your temperature. As you go higher and higher, it gets colder and colder. And yes, continental elevation would also create changes in wind circulation. Say, for example, the case of the Philippines. If, say, we have a prevailing wind coming from our eastern side, so this prevailing wind is always smashing at us. If we have mountain ridges that is blocking the way you know, along the path of this prevailing winds, it would create rain shadows. No? It would block the circulation and would shadow the rest of the area from that wind. So different elevation would actually create changes in your wind circulation. Next would be carbonate silicate geochemical cycle. So as you can see here, different processes would tend to favor different forms of your carbon, no? carbon dioxide in this case. So if weathering is much more favored than the case of your metamorphism, of course, there would be more calcium carbonate than calcium silicate. But when there is a high metamorphism due to plate tectonics, this would create more calcium silicate than your calcium carbonate. So those two are actually kind of balancing each other out. So CO2 gassing is generally the geological carbon cycle. So in this process, say for example your volcano is erupting, it would actually increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the air. And the amount of carbon dioxide in the air is actually important, no? It's actually critical, no? For the Earth's climate. And of course, if there is a lot of volcanic activity ongoing, it would increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the air. But the dissolution of your carbon dioxide into rainwater and eventually sedimentation would actually reduce the carbon dioxide that is present. In your air. No? So importantly, the geological carbon cycle acts as a thermostat because warmer temperature accelerate rock weathering reaction removing carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas, more quickly from the atmosphere. During cold periods, e.g. snowball event, earth events, weathering slows down, leading to the buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which in turn enhance greenhouse warming. For example, because warmer temperatures drives higher rates of chemical weathering in which carbon dioxide reacts with exposed rock, Having more land masses near the equator can result in a removal of atmospheric carbon dioxide, and hence global cooling. The subduction processes, on the other hand, can also affect global climate when sedimentary rock, which is, which is rich in calcium carbonate, is subducted more. <clears throat> so more carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere by volcanoes, resulting in global warming. So that's how it affects that. So we have two processes here. We have the rock weathering and sedimentation and your CO2 outgassing by volcanic eruptions. We're now moving on to the presence of hotspot due to mantle plumes. So this is actually an important island building event or process because through this, the certain island chains are created. For example, the island chains of Hawaii. So this happens because there's an unusually hot mantle plumes that reach the surface of your ocean. No? And as you can see here, 
it's usually these uh, hot bloom locations are usually far from your plate boundaries called hot spot no and chain volcanism is created in this region no the region of hot spots so it's for for example before the if geologists actually measured the age of this different island in this Hawaiian island arc and they have found out that as you go along no as you go along this pattern newer and newer islands were much near here than the islands are here i mean there are older islands in here than in here so old to new that's the trend because what happens is that so since the plate is moving it is the mantle plume is also the mantle plume is also trailing and changing its position that's why it creates this chain of volcanism that moves and that's why there are older islands here than the islands that are here this is Mount Naloa so as the plates are moving it would create active volcano again and would leave the old one to wither away so that's hot spot due to mantle plumes an important uh, also an important island building event for your physical geography okay now for the fourth part of our lecture we'll have a take a look we'll have to take a look at the geological history of the earth space uh, more specifically focusing on the creation of Pangea so first of all I would like you to watch this computer reconstruction of the world continent this is from earth viewer it's actually an app in your cell phone I, I don't know if it is present on Android devices and you can download it and it actually reanimates or it's a computer reconstruction of the world's continent of how it is formed okay okay so I hope you have enjoyed that video and as you can see here so plate tect tectonic is actually the reason for that movement no so it is the central theory of geology that describe how because it's the central theory of geology that describes how earth crusts are being composed at different times of the earth history plate movements have resulted in the formation so plate tectonics have resulted in the formation of different supercontinents from the supercontinents of Nuna, Rodinia to Pangea as you have already viewed on our supplemental videos so plate tectonics have created this different distribution of land masses and of course the location of these large continental masses would significantly affect global climate as we have already discussed that the changes no or the effects of having this large land mass a block of land than a well distributed one it would change the courses of your ocean currents and also change the winds no the winds that are created so that's the effect of land masses so that's the geologic history of the earth so as you have viewed so the massive supercontinent of Pangea has been drifting apart since since 180 million years ago they have been drifting apart and creating this steady sea and then the Laurasian part of your Pangea gave rise to Eurasia and North America while the Gondwana part gave rise to South America, Africa, India, Australia and Antarctica so that's the continents that came from these two large bodies no, of land mass so as of today there are seven major plates that includes the North American plate South American Antarctic Antarctica Eurasia Africa Australia and the Pacific plate which is the biggest one in there and there are other smaller minor plates classified as minor plates um, such as the Juan de Fuca the Arabian the Cocos Nazca, Caribbean, and our very own Philippine Sea Plate. Okay? So, 
all of these uh, geological changes in the Earth's history from Pangaea to present day uh, continental distribution are all a result of your continental plate, this continental movement. All of those events that transpired are actually due to plate tectonics, no? of how Earth's crust are being composed of large plate and those convection and gravity and that new crust is created, the underlying mantle, material acid spreads the center, sea floor spreading, and amid the oceanic ridges, so, so, so on and so forth, so there's subduction zone. And all of this movement, no, this plate movements, is caused by the forces of plate tectonics. So uh, this theory actually explains many geological phenomena and the movement of land masses. And also the distribution of similar fossils from Pangaea to the present day um, continental distribution that we have. And yep, that's it for part two. Stay tuned for part three. I just wanted you to watch me